From the sewage pipe on the quarantined Clavius base, it's the IGN DigiGuy. Please welcome two men who would never shut down HAL 9000, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Mark is uh, eating, what are you eating? Uh, peanut filled pretzels. Lean into the microphone. I told you you had to start for 30 I'm seconds. Make you I was start, eating I'm, peanut I'm, filled pretzels. I'm going to make you start wearing peanut the... Peanut butter uh, filled pretzels, huh? I'm, I'm going to make you wear the, uh, the lav like I'm wearing again. You don't, you, don't, you don't enjoy the lav. You don't love the lav. No, because it's, it's somehow constricting. Okay. It's tr- All right. Fine. So be it. Constricting. Whatever. Um, you know what, Mark? We have a ton of stuff to talk about today. Gobs, heaps, gigantic piles of stuff. And uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna get into it in just a moment, but I do want to read some uh, some listener mail really quickly, which we haven't gotten to uh, in in some time. And uh, listener mail last week? Huh? No, we didn't. We ne- we didn't get to it. Oh, we didn't get to it. We, I was going to, and you know, we got caught up in so many other things, and you kept talking about foreign films and all that kind no, of that stuff. No, that was you. Oh, never mind. Okay, you know, uh, Chevelle Dixon, longtime listener, wrote us back in December and said, I was following your group's awards and liked a lot of your picks. Can't wait to see her and loved Gravity, so I was thrilled with its four wins. You should try to get ties in every category next year uh, to one-up all the ties this year. Also, love the holiday show, especially the interview with Tim Grierson. Many items on my wish list. So, Chevelle, thanks, you, thanks so much. And, and in tandem with that, speaking of the ties, because that, that felt like a good thing to jump off on, um, this year's award season... Is especially is officially completely foobar. You realize that? Yes, because it, you no. You emailed me yesterday, and you said you realize that if the Producers Guild goes for American Hustle, yeah. it's going to win Best Picture. Yeah. The Producers Guild did not go for American Hustle. I know. Thank God. They they they, they tied. Isn't that amazing? And uh, you know, and, and we didn't feel so bad, Lafka, because uh, we had three ties. We had three ties, including a Best Picture tie. But that's that's unprecedented for the Producers Guild to come up with a tie. And their tie in the, in the, it was Gravity and 12 Years a Slave. So now the actors went with, you know, who are usually a really good predictor, went with American Hustle for their ensemble award, which is usually, I mean, that's like five out of the last six have gone to their ensemble choice. And then the last six in a row have gone to the Producers Guild choice, which this year was a tie between Gravity and 12 Years a Slave. So if you're, if you're playing the odds and you're trying to sort of figure out which one of those groups? And keep in mind, those are better predictors than critics groups because they include a lot of people who are Academy voters, and especially the actors. So now I'm, I'm really kind of, it's a toss-up for me. I mean, I know you didn't care for American Hustle a whole lot. I like it, not my favorite film of the year. But that being said, this is very strange. Now we li- the three films that are most nominated for the Academy Awards literally are, a co- it's, 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 it's up in the air. It's a free-for-all. Well, the reason why Hustle still may take it is only because it appeals to the actor's branch so much, and yes. they are the biggest branch. You get the costume and the w- w- wig and the makeup, and everybody's yeah. flamboyant. Fr- and the actors love that stuff. And it's nominated in every single acting category, which is the second year in a row that, uh, that David O. Russell has been able to pull that off. I just, I, I am but, not on board with the David O. Russell research. And I like David O. Russell. I love yeah. Three Kings. I like his, I'm just, this, this whole resurgence with him, I'm just yeah. not buying it. Yeah. Not well. there. Well, anyway, uh, and then Dan from Baltimore, Dan Clark, says, um, it, 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 as the ho- this was just after our holiday show, he says, the holidays approach, people say it's time of giving and cheer. So I want, with that in mind, I just want to thank you for the podcast you do week in and week out. You were the first podcast I ever listened to back in 2009. Ever since, I have been hooked to podcasts. I want to thank you for not only opening up an entire new world of film that I would otherwise have ignored, but also for helping me change the way I process movies. Listening to you both on IGN DigiGods podcast and Stupid for Movies, uh, I saw a true appreciation for the art of film. You inspired me to start writing my own reviews so I can process thoughts even further. And uh, he says, I've never gone to film school, but listening to your podcasts uh, makes me feel as if I have. So I'm really flattered by this. And he said, I had a simple question for you. As the year's winding down, do many of the films coming... Uh, do, uh, uh, as the year is winding down, many are coming out with their top ten movies of the year... Are there any films you feel are not getting their just due as the year and accolades are coming out? Okay, wait. Can I, can I, can I say something? Yes. Uh, why are we reading a uh, Why are we reading an email from someone who says as the year winds down? Well, we're already in the middle of January. Because he wanted why to know wait? films from last year that aren't making top ten lists who, that we feel who, are wait, underrated. Wait, who produces the show? Uh, 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 we do. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, are there any films from last year? We didn't do any last year stuff. So, is there any stuff from last year that you feel was not making top tens? Oh yeah, Star Wars. Because previously you had recommended uh, uh, Police, the My Wen film. 
Which one? The My Wen's Police, the the French film. Oh yes. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, and uh, that was you know a year previously. So, is there anything from last year that's not making top tens that you feel people need to pay attention to? Uh, no, because I feel like the top tens are pretty solid. If, you, if you've got to see her, and you got to see Gravity, it's funny. I actually watched Gravity um, on a on a nineteen inch screen. Yeah, I had no choice. It's not really the same experience. No. On a nineteen. And by the way, I'm very glad that Stephen Price was nominated for best score. Yeah. I mean, come on. How could you not? How true. Not award that score. It's true. It's a great honestly. score. It's a terrific score. Because there's no, I mean, there's no, it's not a, much it's, dialogue. It's like a performer in the film. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, Wade, that sounds like a critic. Yeah, thank you. The music is like a performer in the movie, yeah. says Wade Major. Uh, I, I would say, yes, uh, one movie that got totally shafted, not the butler, uh, that we're going to talk about today, which is Rush. I think Rush. Rush did Rush, get shafted. Rush got hugely shafted, and I think it's, it's one of the best films of the year. It's definitely a top, like, top three for me. Uh, quick two more emails uh, one from um, uh, let's see do Eric Altieri first long time listener Eric Altieri says I got a question for you I've been wondering for a while why the prices of some titles never drop and some do substantially example is Thor on Blu-ray which I don't have yet and it's still twenty nine ninety nine. while the X-Men First Class Blu-ray is five ninety nine. both were released around the same time why is one so much cheaper than the other and um the, the, the reason being that um, the companies that release them have different strategies as to when to lower their prices and when it's sell through and when you want to keep the price up because the sequel might be coming out and so forth and so on. And they all work off of different actuarial charts and they all have different distribution strategies. And uh, some of them care more and some of them spend more. And it's just, they're, they're all just different strategies. It just depends on the, on the distribution company. Uh, but clearly, 20th Century Fox, their prices do drop faster than others. They really like to move prices. Product. They don't like to, to, you know, keep stuff on inventory, in, in on shelves and in warehouses. So that's one reason why you tend to see the 20th Century Fox stuff really, really drop a lot faster. You know? Good know, point, Wade. Know what I'm saying? I do. We have a lot of movies, Wade. Yes, we do. And uh, then, lastly, from. Um, Al in uh, up in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Now that I'm unemployed. And momentarily outside of the capitalism loop, on this occasion, in the spirit of youthful insurrection, I proudly, fiercely, and yes, nostalgically pronounce one more title to the quasi-guilty pleasure list. The Strawberry Statement from 1970. Stuart Hagman. You familiar with it? The Strawberry Statement? Yep. I'm not. You're not familiar with Strawberry no, Statement? No, tell me all about it. Strawberry Statement is one of those uh, kind of late 60s. It was 1970, but it was shot in the late 60s. It's one of those rebel movies, one of those uh, youthful, we're going we're gonna to burn down, uh, you know, like, like a Kent State kind of protest thing, right? Right. That's my daughter you hear in the background. Baby. She's uh, Dating increasingly, so smart. She's increasingly becoming a part of this podcast. He's increasingly no, this, it's, it's a, you know, one of those rebel movies, and it's kind of a big deal. It's, on, it's out actually on DVD from uh, Warner Archive, so it, it went under, uh, beneath the radar. Davis. But it's, you know, Bruce Davison is like really young in it. Uh, Kim Darby coming right off of Miri and uh, True Grit, you know, looking... Miri? You mean the, uh, that episode of Star Trek? Yes, Kim Darby. That's what we know. That's what we know her from. <laughs> when and you say Mary, if you're of a certain age and you say the word Mary, yes. all you think of is that episode of Star Trek. That's right. Going to that crazy planet. Bonk bonk on the head. <laughs> but they're grubs, Mary. <laughs> We're pathetic. <laughs> and who said that line? Uh, Michael J. Pollard. Michael J. Pollard. Coming off of uh, Bonnie and Clyde, uh. which has kind of a connection to today's episode as well. If we get to it, uh, Bud Court was in it. Uh, pretty great. Pretty great, kind of groovy, funky late uh, late seventies uh, artifact. So, uh, anyway. good comment. Moving on. All right, move on. Mark, tell us about some uh, <laughs> tell us about some music. My job here is to move the show along. That's it. Uh, Cliff Richard, still reeling and a rocking live in Sydney. Cliff Richard is one of those um, ageless. Yeah, but you know what? He never really became much. I mean, he had a blip here and there. But if you're you know, if you were big in the seventies or eighties or whatever, he, it's he like, did. A, he did a duet with the uh, with uh, Olivia Newton John on the Xanadu soundtrack. That's that's freaking great. <laughs> anyway, uh, he had a couple of hits: uh, "Dream Lover" and "Willie and the Hand Jive." Um, Devil Woman. I don't know. It's anyway. He's got he's got that Barry Manilow thing going on where he's probably like in his mid sixties, but he's all plastic surgery out. So um, this is him in uh, Sydney, Australia. At the Opera House, and uh, you know, what can I say? I mean, if you like this kind of stuff, go for it. But I just think that Cliff Richard is not really begging for a career reassessment at this point. Saga is a band I've never heard of until I watched Saga Spin It Again. (laughs) 
<laughs> Live in Munich. I'd probably say Saga. Anyway, they had broken up for five years, and then they came back together again to tour uh, Europe. And uh, you know, what can I say? It's really not my... Uh, their music is not really my cup of meat, as they say in uh, Europe. It's, very, it's all very, you know, loud guitar, a little bit uh, thrashy stuff. Not really my thing. I, I would read you the names of the songs, but you haven't heard of them, and neither have I. <laughs> George Thorogood, live at uh, Montreux, 2013. George Thorogood, of course, uh, is, has been around for a long, long time. All that big, chunky blues b- rock b- b- stuff. Bad to the bone. That bar, huh? Bad to the bone, that, bars rock, that bar rock stuff. I like it. I think, I think he's terrific. He's got great teeth. He's, he's also had a lot of work done, you can tell. Yeah. But um, anyway, um, this was in 2013. And uh, songs include uh, Who Do You Love and I Drink Alone and Get a Haircut, Bad to the Bone. And it's good stuff. This is a bonus interview with George Thorogood, and uh, he kind of still rocks, I have to say. I really, do. I really think he does. Uh, the big music DVD of the week is the 1983 Us Festival, days one through three. Now, in 83, the Us Festival was a big, big deal. It wasn't quite Live Aid big, big deal, but it was a big, big deal. And um, this one contains the first three days of the festival, uh, May 28th to May 30th, and U2, now this is 1983, folks. U2 plays Sunday Bloody Sunday, and Electric Company, and, <laughs> oh my God, Stevie Nicks, you know, Stand Back and Missing Persons Words. Um, stand Back? Yeah. Yeah, Stand Back, yeah, Stand don't. Back. The Clash, yeah. Men at Work, Stray Cats, English Beat, In Excess, The Vinyls, the lead singer of The Vinyls, uh, she recently passed away. So anyway, sad. The Us Festival of 83 was a big deal at the time. Again, it was, it, it, that was an era of rock mega concerts. And uh, this one was, n- again, not as great as uh, Live Aid, but still was pretty cool. So if, the, if your dad wants to be nostalgic for Quarter Flash, you know where to go. Groovy. Um, a few classical things that I'm going to go through as well. That, uh, I'm glad we're starting with the most boring stuff, Wade. I'm glad get, we're not get, starting get, with the interesting stuff. We're get, we'll get, it gets people in, in anticipation. Well, is that people, how it works? Yeah, they work up in anticipation and, 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 and in anticipation of that. <laughs> in anticipation of that. I'll, you could, don't, don't blow any of that on me. <laughs> people will wonder what we're talking about. Uh, from Naxos uh, releases a lot of great classical stuff, and uh, I'm going to move from all Mark's rock and rolly stuff. You what know is what this? The, in, 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 what is it? You'll see what it is. Uh, some great classical stuff from Naxos. Which I'll go through here real quickly. Uh, we were not able to talk about it at the end of last year, but it's all still absolutely uh, relevant. The Philip Glass uh, release, The Perfect American, from Opus Art on Blu-ray. I am not a Philip Glass fan, but this is um, you know, a, a pretty great concert performance uh, if, you want to, uh, if you are a Philip Glass fan. Uh, this is a you know a, a rather opulent production of The Perfect American, which is this you know it's an opera basically it's you know but not my kind of opera but still it's on Blu-ray and uh, very nicely done. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach, the uh, Knabenchore Hanover Christmas. This is a, a lovely little kind of um, uh, chamber performance of Christmas music, which, of course, is good any time. Don't just limit yourself. It's Bach, for crying out loud. Very, very nice. That's from uh, Rondeau Productions. Then uh, Mozart's Die Zauberflotte, The Magic Flute. That is a, that's going to be a huge hit you know, for our listeners. Kenneth Branagh did a magic flute uh, uh, thing this last year. Did you know that? I have a magic flute in my pants. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's good for the kids. That's good for the kids. Thank you. No, this, there was a, Kenneth Branagh did a staging of the magic flute as a film. He directed it last year. Anyway, uh, this is Mozart's uh, magic flute. A beautiful, beautiful performance. And uh, Mark just left the room. This is how professional this show is. Um, the, uh, anyway, this is a beautiful performance that uh, is well worth checking out. This is from the, uh, the uh, Vienna Symphonic Orchestra, uh, directed by Patrick Summers, and uh, some beautiful, beautiful singing there. Let me get through this as quickly as possible, because then I can do more stuff before Mark comes back. Uh, Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, which was uh, the story of Onegin, some people may know, was actually made as a very, very good film starring Ray Fiennes, directed by his sister Sophie Fiennes. Not the, uh, the Royal Opera version of it, but this is the Royal Opera version with Tchaikovsky's music, and it is just spectacular, beautifully, beautifully staged, well worth checking out. Another Opus Art Blu-ray. Um, the last two uh, kind of, well let's see we've got a few other Blu-rays here we've got a Blu-ray and DVD set 
Uh, you can get it on either Blu-ray or DVD. Um, I would recommend the Blu-ray, obviously. This is Maris Jansen's The Complete Beethoven Symphonies with the, uh, the uh, Bayern Munich Symphony. And uh, first-rate sound, really, is the only reason you want to get this. The, uh, the Blu-rays always obviously have the, the lossless audio, which is unprecedented. And if you have a really first-rate home system, don't even worry about it. You could turn the video off. The audio, will be, it'll be like having a concert in your home. Back in the late 1950s, uh, Glenn Gould, the amazing great pianist, the legendary pianist, uh, went on a tour in Moscow, and you know, in the, the height of the Cold War and uh, communism raging, and uh, he was the first uh, musician, the first North American musician ever to uh, make that kind of a trip behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, they now have Glenn Gould, The Russian Journey on Blu-ray, which is a fascinating kind of archival collection of materials. All of them, uh, many of them, fi- released from the, uh, the Canadian government, actually that uh, sort of document that incredible tour, and it is really, really first-rate. It's, it's only an hour long, but it's on Blu-ray, and it is a wonderful artifact for any fan of that amazing talent. And then uh, Das Rheingold from the Orchestra of the Teatro alla Scala. This is uh, the, from uh, Richard Wagner's uh, Nibelungen Ring. This is uh, from Art House Music, a just really, really powerful live uh, performance uh, from May 2010, and uh, if you are obviously a Wagner fan, you will just groove to this on, like it's a rock and roll concert. It's on Blu-ray. And then lastly, a DVD of Leonard Bernstein doing Elgar's Enigma Variations, which includes a rehearsal documentary and an interview with Bernstein. Uh, this is all performed by the BBC Symphony Orchestra, obviously before Bernstein passed away. And this is only on DVD, uh, but well worth checking out if you are a Bernstein fan. Uh, beautiful work all around, just fantastic music, and uh, really an interesting peek behind his process and behind the whole orchestral process in general. And just in time, Mark now returns to the microphone. This, that's how professional the show is. We now have babies cooing in the background. Mark takes phone calls in the middle of the show. We're a professional show. We're a professional operation. And Mark's chewing now. Bad grandpa. <laughs> I don't like jackass. I never like jackass. I never will like jackass. But bad grandpa thought it was cute. You know why? Because it has a certain charm to it that the other stuff doesn't have. Yes. Wait, what are you holding? I hold, I'm holding the thing that I told you that, that you, you didn't know what this was. No. Good grief. It looks like a vibrator. Or, or some roll-on deodorant. There you go. Is that what it is, roll-on deodorant? It's, 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 it's some kind of uh, chemical that I, I'm, I'm afraid to... Uh... You made it seem as if, like, I didn't know what it was. You don't know what it is either. <laughs> it's, well... Anyway, Johnny Knoxville plays um, Irving Zisman. That's his, uh, you know, his 86-year-old grandfatherly character. And he takes his uh, quote-unquote grandson around uh, America with all sorts of crazy hijinks, hidden camera hijinks ensue. I, I, I don't like jackass, I'll admit it, but I, I thought this was kind of cute. Uh, the Fifth Estate is a movie that I didn't like. Um, it's very exciting. It's very visceral. It's, it's, it's got its surface thrills, but ultimately it's not a very interesting character study of Julian Assange, the, uh, the so founder dis- of Wikileaks. So disappointing. I agree. I really, I, I, I expected, I, I, like, I, you know, the trailer for this was great. Yeah, well, this is also part of uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's, uh, you know, breakout year. And ultimately, he's fine. He looks like, he looks like uh, Assange. He has that same sense of ego and self-regard and a little bit of megalomania as Assange. Do you learn anything about the, the whole WikiLeaks thing in this? Uh, no. No? I mean, yes, but it's, it, it, it just charts, it charts his rise from, like, Assange is like this shambling guy who blows in out of nowhere with this big idea and then slowly and, and then slowly as his leaks become more and more controversial and you know and and you, you start to deal with like right. government improprieties and bringing down banks and he gets more and more power how he starts to kind of believe his own press right. and lose it but the problem is that it's a as a thriller it works but a thriller is not how it should be working right so it stars Benedict Cumberbatch and Daniel Brühl, who we'll talk about in a second, right after uh, we talk about um, Last Vegas, which I thought was, and this is kind of an insult, which I thought was completely pleasant. Now, when a movie stars Michael Douglas, Robert De Niro, Morgan Freeman, and Kevin Kline, completely pleasant, not what you were hoping for. No. So it's about a bunch of guys who, uh, old, older guys who go to Vegas. They've been best friends since kids. And they go to Vegas and they, uh, they freak out with prostitutes and, uh, and yeah. Viagra and all that sort of hacky comic stuff. So 
if this starred any other four people, I wouldn't even care less. But the fact is, is that I don't know what to say. Is, you, know, you know what this is? This is a great rental. Yeah. It's a great Saturday night rental. It's got four great actors who we love to see. And even if it's like a nothing for them, it's still fun. Las Vegas, yep. what can I say? Las Vegas. I think I will just, I think I'll watch that tonight. I think I'll watch all No, those, you won't. Maybe. I, on the radio next week, I got too many other things to watch. You know what I have to watch for next week? Just, just as a little detour here. Here's what I have to watch for next week. I haven't watched any of them yet. Um, uh, give me shelter, run and jump, enemies closer, Gloria, if you build it, like father, like son, the grounded, 24 exposures, nights of bad ass Unbelievable. Then we better get this podcast yeah. over with so you can be watching movies. Rush is one of the best films of last year. Rush didn't get a single Oscar nomination, even though it was directed by uh, Ron Howard, even though it was written by Peter Morgan, even though it stars Thor, for crying out loud, Chris Hemsworth, and even though it also stars Daniel Bruhl, who's another like major actor of the moment, as you just noted, in uh, The Fifth Estate. Daniel Bruhl, a German actor, who incarnates Nicky Lauda so well, I thought for sure there was a chance when I saw this movie that he would be... Uh, in the mix for a best actor you know what it, Universal completely caved on this they didn't know how to market it they just they didn't make enough money they felt and they didn't want to put anything into an Oscar campaign it was unbelievable they just totally folded on this film's Oscar chances and it's so disappointing because it's one of the best films of last year absolutely amazing uh, if you don't know it it's the story of the um the rivalry, the legendary rivalry uh, during the 1970s between uh, Nicky Lauda, the, uh, the German um, racer, and James Hunt, the British racer in the Formula One realm. And they're completely different. You know, Hunt is like flamboyant, and he's a playboy, and he's rock and roll, and Nicky Lauda is just that German stereotype. He's focused, he's intense, no fun, no nothing, all business, all the time, right? And it's really an intriguing story. It is an amazing story. I'm amazed it never got made before. Uh, it got made because Peter Morgan had a house in Switzerland that was uh, next door to Nicky Lauda. And he met Nicky Lauda, who, of course, started you know, bloviating his greatness to, uh, you know, to Peter Morgan. And he was like, is this, why has this never been a movie? And Morgan uh, wrote it up. And he got Nicky Lauda to agree to basically keep his hands off. And Nicky Lauda said to him... Um, and this, unfortunately, is not going to happen now. He said, uh, get me to the Oscars and don't make me look like a poof. Well, he did the latter, didn't do the former. It's so upsetting. He's not going to get to the Oscars. And, they, and it should, because it's such a good movie. Such a good movie. Anyway, Blu-ray, DVD, uh, ultraviolet combo. Um, it's Ron Howard's best film, which Claudia Puig actually is quoted on the box as saying so. And uh, she and I both said so on Film Week because we were on uh, the day of opening. And it is. It is Ron Howard's best film, far and away. It is a magnificent movie. It is superb filmmaking in every, every respect. There's, this film should have had 10 Academy Award nominations. And as if that's not enough for you racing fans, uh, there is a, uh, a documentary out called One. That is the number one and uh, it is all about the, uh, the in, it's narrated by Michael Fassbender, of all people, and it's all about the golden age of Formula One during this exact period. And uh, this is released, obviously, by Millennium intentionally to capitalize on, uh, uh, on Rush because Nicky Lauda and James Hunt are all over this movie, as is Jackie Stewart, who we all know from pushing Mattel, you know, toys in the 1970s when you and I were growing up, and, and Michael Schumacher and uh, Sebastian Vettel and Jackie X and, you know, Mario Andretti. Lot, all these guys, are, they're all over this thing. So uh, pretty great. Pretty great documentary. I would say get this and watch it in tandem with Rush. They are both absolutely superb. I love racing. I grew up on Formula One. Can't get enough. Really? Can't get enough. I didn't know that. I know. A lot of people don't know that. You All kinds of things. Up. No, I'd love Formula One. Really? When everybody else is like, Indy, Indy 500, NASCAR, I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Watch a Formula One race sometime. A Formula One race is magnificent because you're going through cities and you're going left and right. It's not just an oval over and over and over and freaking over. Indy 500 is like, oh, there's another lap and another lap and another lap and another lap. Oh, a pit stop and another lap. Oh, he's passing. Oh, and a pit stop. It, 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 when you're, it, you only ever turn like one, you turn in one direction. You're going to get a cramp. Formula One is, what it's, is where it's at. It is an amazing sport, Formula One racing. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2 in 3D. I don't know why this even exists. 
I, uh, now that I have a, a child, uh, I, you would think that I have a softer spot in my heart for these kinds of movies, and I just, I kind of don't get it. This is from Sony Animation, and uh, the first one just perplexes me. I don't find it that cute. This one, I kind of find more of the same. People love this thing, so by all means, disregard everything that I'm talking about. You get some mini-movies on here as well, which I think are actually some, somewhat fun. Like Attack of the uh, 50-Foot Gummy Bear is actually much more entertaining than the movie itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, whatever. 3D is fine. The Blu-ray is really good. It is what it is. Um, Mark, why don't we get into some... Um, some movies people care about? Yes, yeah, some classic movies. Why don't we? Uh, let me really quickly go through some Paramount releases from the CBS Paramount Library uh, that people may never have heard of. And uh, that would be Jack Lemmon and Barbara Harris, first of all, in The War Between Men and Women, also with Jason Robards. You ever heard of this? Jason Robards, yes, I've no, heard no, of no, no, The War Between Men and Women. I've you, heard of it. It is it, quite old. It, it, you know what? It was not that old. It's 1972. It's not like it's, you know, 50s or anything. Um, actually, not bad. Quite, quite fun. It is a, uh, it, it's one of those kind of wacky romantic comedies from the period that feels very, I mean, it's very, very much of the 70s. But um, actually, not bad at all. Great Marvin Hamlish score. Uh, pretty fun. Barbara Harris, not my favorite actress, but uh, she and Jack Levin, some good chemistry. Very entertaining. Dustin Hoffman in uh, Who is Harry Kellerman and Why is He Saying Those Terrible Things About Me? A, uh, a, a very underrated uh, Dustin Hoffman performance. Very, very quirky, cool, groovy, funky movie from 1971. Uh, directed by the uh, late Ulu Grossbard and uh, featuring songs by Shel Silverstein. Right? Shel Silverstein. Fla. Gotta love Shel Silverstein. Anyway, um, no, the, Dustin Hoffman plays uh, George Soloway here, and um, pretty great. Pretty great performance. And then also Jack Lemmon and Catherine Deneuve in April Fools from 1969. And I know a lot of people are thinking, really? Jack, uh, Jack Lemmon and Catherine Deneuve made a movie together? What are you kidding me? You know what? Not bad. It's, it's a romance. It's a romantic comedy. It's uh, not the funniest movie, not the most romantic movie that you're ever going to see, but it works. Written by Hal Dresner, who did uh, more than a few decent little things at the time, and a great song by Burt Bacharach and uh, Hal David. Good stuff. I liked it. <laughs> he's, like, he's like staring at it or something. What are yeah, you doing? It's all right. Well, you, you know who directed this? Stuart Rosenberg. Stuart Rosenberg. Isn't that amazing. Stuart, Stuart Rosenberg. I feel so bad for Stuart Rosenberg's career because there's a guy who should have been like, you know, he should have had that Francis Coppola, Hal Ashby, Martin Scorsese career in the 70s and 80s. He just should have. I mean, he's, Stuart Rosenberg is an unbelievably good director, but he just never, I don't know, for whatever reason, he never kind of, I mean, he should have, he should have had at least one Academy Award, never really caught fire. And then he, you know, passed away just a few years ago. And it's just... You know, it never, it, I mean, all, it just never really took off for him. Cool Hand Luke is kind of where it kind of peaked in a, in a way. Totally. That's just too bad. Uh, <clears throat> Dracula 3D. Now, I'm not a big fan of Dario Argento. I understand why he's a cult dude and uh, people love his cult crap, but uh, not a fan. But I do kind of like Dracula 3D, not because it's Dario Argento, but because I think that the vampire story needs to be like de douchified. Yeah. With all this, you know, vampire stuff with the, the Kristen Stewart or whatever the hell that does the vampire crap that no one right. cares about, all the kids love, who cares, yeah. go yeah. away. Right. This is just like a classic vampire story. Mm hmm. Right? Totally. It's like 400 years he was dead, he comes back to life. Yep. Very exciting. Yep. The movie stars uh, Asia Argento, who is uh, Dario's daughter. Aja. Aja, I know. Yeah, whatever. I knew that when I said it, and then I yeah. realized uh, I said it wrong. And it's got Rucker Hauer in it, which is uh, cool. He plays a vampire expert. And uh, look, I'm not a big Ar Argento fan, but this has uh, this is kind of uh, it's kind of cheesy, fun, entertaining, uh, kind of recalibrating Dracula for what it really is, which is just baroque and fun and a little bit cheesy, mm -hmm. and that's it. Great. Scott. Wade, uh, I'm going to say something very controversial, and yes. you know what I'm going to say. I know you don't like it. It's a mad, 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 mad world. I'm not funny. You, I'm going to let you vent your bile to begin with. Not and then, funny. And then I am going to correct you. Not funny. This is the uh, classic Stanley Kramer film. Now, Stanley Kramer was a, uh, was sort of known more as an issues director than he mm -hmm. was a director of uh, comedies. Yes. Uh, this film works uh, solely by virtue of its cast. 
which if you were alive in 1963, it would be like 18 Christmases all strung together. Milton Berle, Dick Sean, Sid Caesar, Buddy Hackett, Ethel Merman, Mickey Rooney, Jonathan Winters, who passed away recently. Um, this is all about a chase. This chase big... Lounge? <laughs> chase Lounge? A bunch of guys chasing after some money. That's what they're doing. So I, I, will give you, I will give you three reasons why, this, why I don't like this movie. The number one, the number six, the number three. This movie is 163 minutes. Stop that. There's no such thing as a funny movie that's 163 minutes. It doesn't work that way. It's just so bloated. I'm going to give you three reasons why this is one of the funniest movies ever made. Okay? You ready for this? Three reasons why this movie is a classic and should be seen by everyone. Yes. You ready for that? Reason number one, Dick Sean. Reason number two, Dick Sean. Reason number three, Dick Sean. Yeah. That's why this movie is hilarious. Dick Sean, in his little red shorts, go-go dancing... Maybe one of the three or four funniest things I've ever seen in a movie in my entire life. And when you first see it, it's all one shot. The camera, it's a lock-off. He and that groovy woman in the little beach shack, that little surf shack, just doing their little go-go dancing. And he's, he hollers and he gets on the phone, zips out. I'm coming, Baba. I'm coming. Come on, give me a break. He's and then, awesome. And then what happens in the other 162 minutes? <laughs> oh, you get Milton Berle and you get uh, you no know, everybody else in the movie. It's pretty great. I love it. No, it's not. You know, the, the best thing, too, is if you live in this particular area, the California Incline... Never really shows up in movies. But when Phil Silvers in his little sports car comes ripping down Pacific Coast Highway and turns up the California Incline the wrong way, like which you would get a ticket for if you did it in real life, best moment I've ever. I've done that, by the way. Oh, is that the one where he, he makes the right on the California Incline makes going right. north on PCA? Oh, I've does. done that. We've all done that. No, no one does that. I've done that. Have you done we, that? We've all done that. Everybody's. I saw a guy that last week doing that. I've he's, never done he's that. He's going north on PCH, yes. and he makes a right on uh, the California Incline. You're not allowed to do that. Well, I know you're not allowed. People still do it. You're not allowed to do lots of things. <laughs> I've never People seen, do it. I've never seen anyone do that. Oh, it's such a funny movie. It just, oh, it's just so funny. It's the worst. All right. Um, we got four films from Twilight Time. Got to love Twilight Time. Uh, you go to screenarchives.com to get their stuff. There are limited releases. Twilight Time does a wonderful job of uh, licensing movies from studios like uh, Columbia and 20th Century Fox that would otherwise probably never see the light of a Blu-ray. And uh, they got three really great ones here. Uh, Columbia, back in 1953, became the first studio to jump on the 3D bandwagon. You know, 3D was originally when it first came out in that 1950s uh, House of Wax incarnation. It was a, an exploitation format, right? It was movies and drive-ins and out-of-the-way places that were trying to find a way to get to, to nudge in and get a little publicity outside the uh, studio system. And finally, a few studios were like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bite. And uh, the first one that the studio did actually was, was Columbia, 1953, Man in the Dark. It's a noir. It's a thriller. Uh, not very good, but it is, it is a fascinating um, look into the past at how a studio attempted to capitalize on 3D. And uh, it's, you know, certainly not today's 3D where they just sort of, they, they, they're not going out of their way to poke things in your face. Uh, here they, uh, they really, really try to, you know, find all kinds of gimmicky ways to do it. It's actually quite fun. So if you can watch this, if you have a 3D television, which are going to be obsolete soon, aren't they? They're not Thank make... goodness. I know. So if you have a 3D television you would de and, and you enjoy a little bit of the 3D action, this is one you definitely want to add because it has archival value. It has historic value. Uh, Zulu... From uh, which was originally a 20th Century Fox release, is a 1964 film that uh, has sort of uh, gone by the wayside. Not the best made film of all time. Uh, Cy Enfield, not, kinda, not exactly David Lean, but uh, this is most famous because it has some tremendous John Barry music, which you get in an isolated score track. And uh, you also get uh, film historians... Are you ready for this, Mark? The commentary is by film historians Nick Redman and Lem Dobbs. Lem Dobbs, he's... Uh... Soderbergh's guy. Well, yeah, yeah but it's, it's funny that, you know, Lem Dobbs and Nick Redman are now film historians. Because that, that's not exactly, I mean, Nick Redman is a, a producer and, uh, you know, Lem Dobbs is a screenwriter. And I, you know, that's sort of not what I would have expected them to, be, to, to go by. They could have said, you know, by film, just by Lem Dobbs and Nick Redman. Anyway, uh, this, of course, is, is about the, um, the Battle of Rourke's Drift which is this kind of legendary um, Alamo-type uh, clash where, you, you know, the, the little charge of the Light Brigade, whatever, where uh, 4,000 Zulu warriors, you know, go up against 150 British uh, soldiers. And um, it's, it's definitely a film of its era. You want to watch it 
primarily because Michael Caine often references this movie in talk shows because this is the movie where he's not playing a blue collar guy. You know, M Michael Caine has often said you only ever do the Cockney guy because you're you're a real South Londoner, you're a Cockney guy, you're Get Carter, you're that guy, right? And and he's like, no, I, I did I did actually that that proper British accent once in Zulu, and it's weird seeing him do it because you realize that he never does it when you watch the movie. Wait, uh, no one cares. I know. Anyway, similarly, Khartoum, directed by Basil Dearden in uh, 1966, stars uh, Charlton Heston, Laurence Olivier, Ralph Richardson, pretty good, you know, all-star cast of the time. This is a, another colonial story uh, that basically takes place in the, uh, in the Sudan, and it's the story of the British facing a, who was uh, the um, Laurence Olivier playing the Mahdi character. Laurence Olivier is not, the, not a British guy in this. He's sort of the, the, um, the Osama bin Laden of the 19th century. And uh, it, it's got a lot of interesting uh, connections to the present day, the war on terrorism and all that kind of stuff. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, Dearden, you know, one of the better directors of his day and a uh, very good cast. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely check that one out. Good isolated score there as well. And then Anthony Hopkins and Jessica Lange in the misbegotten Titus, which uh, Fox has allowed Twilight Time to put out on Blu-ray. This is a much more recent film than you would expect. This is Ju that's the Julie Taymor. It's the Julie Taymor adaptation of Titus Andronicus, the uh, Shakespearean play, which a lot of people consider Shakespeare's worst play. So she obviously decided, I'm going to prove that it's not. And uh, it's got a great uh, isolated score with um, uh, of, of the Elliot Goldenthal music, which also includes an audio commentary with composer Elliot Goldenthal. And the Elliot Goldenthal, he had a moment as, as like the film composer of the future, it, and it never happened. But you realize the reason Elliot Goldenthal writes the music for Julie Taymor's movies is because they're been, married. They're, well, they're not married, but well, they might as well be. They've been together forever. It might be common law at this point. It might be over ten years. Oh, it's well over ten years. Yeah. It's like fifty. It's like ninety-five or ninety-six yeah. or something. But he was like good. That. No, he, he, he composed the music for one of the Alien films. He's still it's really good. good. He's still really good. So I mean, it, it's great music, great isolated score. The film itself has that whole Julie Taymor, you know, like super. We're gonna funk everything up and you know put weird hairstyles and costumes and tattoos and art direction to the nth degree. Um, it's it's really overwrought. It's not Shakespeare at his best. But I will say this: the shining moment in this film belongs to Harry Lennox, uh, Harry, otherwise known as Harry J. Lennox who almost steals the movie, and I thought he was going to be, like, the next big thing at that point. I, I just, I don't know why he didn't take off, but anyway. And before I turn this back over to Mark, uh, quickly, a couple of criterions that are uh, definitely worth checking out. One is an Aki Karzmaki film, the other a Terrence Davies movie, two filmmakers who aren't always on everybody's radar, but The Long Day Closes from 1992... Um, you know, Terrence Davies has really had his his movies tend to be very, very slow, but they are and also very, very autobiographical. His you know, growing up in World War II in the fifties and all this, and it's this is very much a, a one of those movies. It's about the nineteen fifties, him growing a little boy growing up in Liverpool, who is your surrogate Terrence Davies, and um, it, but it's very dreamlike, very poetic. And, uh, and really very accomplished. And I'm so glad that Criterion kind of plucked this film from obscurity because I don't think otherwise anyone would have released this on, uh, on Blu-ray. Uh, it is a fantastic Blu-ray DVD uh, combo set, which all the Criterions are now. Everything is dual format, Blu-ray and DVD. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful transfer. It comes from a 2K digital film transfer, which Davies can, uh, supervised himself along with his, his DP. And uh, they, they both give the uh, audio commentary as well, which is fine. Uh, you also get a South Bank show episode from 1992 featuring Davies and uh, new interviews and uh, the trailer. And it's really, it's, it's quite lovely. That also reminds me that the South Bank show, which is a tremendous show, more episodes of that show need to be put out on DVD. Because there's a South Bank show with uh, David Lean and Robert Bolt that is just superb. And I only have it on, on uh, like my VHS recording where I recorded it off of a really bad uh, public television transmission. And uh, I... A public television transmission? What are you, night night? Was this the Twilight Zone? Well, it, it, it was, I say that because it was coming through the cable, but it was like all kind of distorted and Wiggles? Weird. It was just bad. Squiggles. It was a long time ago. And La Vie de Bohème, uh, the Aki Karzmaki film. Aki Karzmaki, the, uh, of course, one of the two Karzmaki brothers from Finland who just make very strange, peculiar, weird, quirky, deadpan movies that, uh, that are sort of like David Lynch on Quaaludes. That's the best thing I can say it. Anyway, this is about a bunch of, uh, bunch of their usual, typical kind of uh, Karzmaki, funky losers uh, living in Paris. 
and it's actually based on books by um, Henri Merger called Scenes from the Life of La Boheme. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a little bit like um, the Jim Jarmusch film Down by Law. Yes. That's the best analogy that I can make. It's, a, it's very much like a European version of that. And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of similarity between Jim Jarmusch and Kar- Karzmaki in particular. So um, you get a really great transfer here, documentary on the making of the film, interview with one of the actors, and uh, the usual great booklet that has cool essays and stuff in it. 1992, La Vie de Bohème by Aki Karzmaki, dual format, Blu-ray and DVD from Criterion. Wait, let me tell you something. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. Oh, set on Blu-ray. That's been out wow, before. Wow, it's been out before. Well, this is the standalone. Oh. By so, the way. Oh, so, you, so if you hate all the other films and this is the only one in the series that you want, you don't actually want to have to buy uh, Crystal Skull or be, even put I'm, one I, penny toward Crystal Skull. I'm going to tell you something. Yeah. <clears throat> if you actually buy this because you don't like the other three, you're an idiot. Just buy all of them. It doesn't matter. It just it's a great. It's, the series is the series. Yeah. I think the first one has some moments. I, I, I think the first one's kind of underrated a little bit. I really like the third one with Sean Connery. I hear the you. fourth one was uh, horrifying. Yeah. Uh, but still, I mean, come on, folks, get the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, Machete Kills. I really wanted to like Machete, and I didn't like Machete, and I really wanted to like Machete Kills, and I didn't like Machete Kills. Um, it's with Charlie Sheen, Sofia Vergara, and of course. Uh, Danny Trejo, who has like 250 credits on, Rotten, on uh, what's it called, IMDb. He really yeah. does. He's got like over 200 movies or like 190 <laughs> movies or something. I know, and half of them were last year. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mel Gibson's in this too. And, uh, you know, I just, it, it wants to be just like completely over the, and, and it is, completely over the top, absurd and ridiculous, and it knows how cheesy it is, and it totally gets that vibe. But I just find it's a whole bunch of flash and dash, and it doesn't really engage me that much. I just wish it was funnier. I wish it was more clever. I wish it was it winked more towards the films that it was homaging, as I make yeah. a word. Mm-hmm. And I just really want to like these movies, but uh, but I just don't. Although it does uh, co-star Amber Heard. Wait, who is Amber Heard? Amber Heard is uh, was of course Mandy Lane, and anyone who listened to the show last week knows that uh, all the boys love or two weeks ago, all the boys love Mandy Lane. If you listened to the show last week, you know that she, Mandy Lane now married Johnny Depp, so only Johnny Depp gets to marry Mandy Lane. Yeah, that was a great joke. It was a, it was a great joke last week, and it's a great joke this week. Thank you. And it'll be a great joke next week when I use it again. <laughs> exactly. Um, Cat People from 19... 19- oh, the, uh, the, the old black and white movie. Yes. No. No, this is the remake of the old black and white yeah. movie, kind of. And, uh, but this so is not, by... not the Val Luton Cat People. No. This is the Paul Schrader Cat People. This is a Paul Schrader Cat People from yeah. 1982. So because it's Paul Schrader, it is, it is pretty erotic... And there's a lot of, there's a huge amount of, obviously, mm. sexual overtones and yeah, undertones and subtext and, uh, and o- overtext and general text. Yeah. It's, um, it's this very freaky, interesting fantasy horror kind of movie. It's always really curious, always kind of intriguing, very twisty, very twisted. Um, I just, this film was pretty controversial for the time. It, the music was by Giorgio Moroder. And there was a uh, the song from the movie uh, mm-hmm. by it was David Bowie, right? Yeah, yeah it was David Bowie. Sure. He uh, did the song for the movie, and um, it's a cool song. And I like this movie. Groovy. Hey, that's your daughter. Yes, it is. Aw, she's crying. She doesn't want to go down. Freaking kid. She, she doesn't want to go down for her nap. If you want his, if you want to see something totally cool, mm-hmm. totally different, totally erotic, kind of kinky, with Nastasha Kinsky. Oh. Kinky Kinsky. I hear you. Uh, I would go for uh, Cat People. It's, told, it's a totally cool cult movie that was kind of forgotten, and hopefully this new Blu-ray release from the good folks at, uh, at uh, Screen Factory. It's weird that, or in Universal, but it's weird that Universal wouldn't, wouldn't want to put this out and they, they'd want to throw it to Screen Factory. You know, uh, well, Screen Factory, which of course is the genre line of Shout Factory, they, they also do a lot of really cool licensing a la... They do. You know, Twilight Time and uh, Olive. So, anyway. All right. Uh, well, hang on for a second, Way. Let's talk about yes. another couple more hard no, things. No, by all means. Uh, Boris Karloff, uh, Die, Monster, Die. Now, Die, Monster, Die is one of the more f- infamous or infamous Boris Karloff films. He was getting older at the time. But um, I think part of the reason why this movie is so famous is because of the title. It's just so ridiculous. Um, anyway, uh, Karloff uh, stars as... Um, this guy who's doing the secret, secret experiments inside this really creepy mansion, 
and uh, there's a young American visitor, and of course, a whole lot of terror to be had there. So um, it's completely cheesy, totally cool. This is one of those movies where when it's Halloween, yep. if you want to put this in your Blu-ray player on like repeat during your Halloween party, it'd be a total hit. Mm-hmm. Really fun, really ridiculous. Boris Karloff looking just old and gray and horrible in uh, Die Monster Die. There's also a um, double feature Blu-ray, The Beast of Hollow Mountain and The Neanderthal Man. I, I couldn't get through either of these. They're just too mm-hmm. stupid. <laughs> um, but you know what? But again, it, it, look, it's we we love Scream Factory. But I'm yeah. just saying, it's one of those movies where like it's sure. Halloween, you know, Halloween party, it's thrown in the Blu-ray player. So, um, the Neanderthal Man is about a, is about a, 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 this mad scientist who comes up with this little this little serum and he uses it on his housekeeper and she turns into an ape. <laughs> I mean, come on! <laughs> can't beat that. And the other one, Beast of Hollow Mountain, is about this rancher. He lives in Mexico, and uh, there's a swamp near the um, near the ranch. And supposedly, legend has it in the swamp, a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we finally have uh, a two-disc collector's edition, a great documentary called uh, Never Sleep Again. This is all about the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And it, they bring together everybody, Wes Craven, uh, Robert England, Heather Langenkamp, um, also a bunch of people who you may not even remember were in the movies or associated with the movies, and they got stuff to say about them. I like this uh, documentary. It's pretty cool. I wasn't, I wasn't really a big fan of um, uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street series. When I was a kid, I didn't really like any of that kind of 80s horror stuff, but um, it's good. And I think Wes Craven might be due for a bit of a career reappreciation. I agree with you. Don't you think? I do. I think he, you know what it is? It might be too late for him, but I think he needs like one more good movie. It's one more. I agree. One more. I know. One more move where you go, oh, wow, that's how it's done. Like Scream, you yep. thought, oh, my God, that's how it's done. Totally. He needs one more. I agree. Uh, we're you know, going to blow through a few things here. We're going to wrap the show up pretty soon. So uh, from Warner Brothers Archive Collection, the Warner Archive Collection, which you can get to warnerarchive.com and uh, see all the kind of uh, the, the DVD-R things that they throw out of, over there. The, we have three that are TNT originals. Do you realize how long the TNT originals have been floating around? Uh, four days. TNT original, I mean, original movies for TNT, I, it, they've been around a long time. And uh, Arthur Penn directed one. There's three that I have here called The Portrait with Gregory Peck and Lauren Bacall. That tells you how long ago this was. Uh, that's not bad. It's a you know family drama, and clearly everybody's on the on the wane here. Otherwise, you wouldn't get Gregory Peck and uh, and Arthur Penn working in television. Um, but uh, not bad at all, actually. Very nicely scripted by Lynn Roth, and um, you know it's 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 a good pairing, decent movie. Doesn't deserve to be on a regular DVD, but excellent release for for DVD-R. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave stars in Tennessee Williams' Orpheus Descending, produced for television and directed by Peter Hall, who, of course, is the father of Rebecca Hall, who's a bit of yes. a big deal now. Peter Hall, very, very good director, uh, Royal Shakespeare Company, done lots of great stuff for, for the stage as well. And uh, he's actually made a few you know, decent uh, theatrical films. And uh, he adapted this and directed it, and because he is a stage guy, does a very, very, very good job of it. Kevin Anderson plays Val, and I was thinking, watching this, I'm like, Kevin Anderson? He was a big deal for a moment. He was kind of like the, uh, you know, he was, he, was on, he was on the move. What, what happened to him? What happened to him? Where Kevin Anderson? Go? What did he direct? No, he, what he, he acted in. Kevin oh. Anderson. Kevin Anderson. Oh, that guy. He was in, uh, wasn't he, was he in Trans-Siberian? But he hasn't been remember. in anything for years. And he was kind of on the bubble, right? He was like a, he, you know, he was yep. the up-and-comer, right? And now he's the down-and-goer. And he was an up-and-comer, now he's a down-and-goer. And then a surprising effort for television, certainly one of the best things that's ever been done for uh, TNT, is uh, Heart of Darkness, which we're all, we usually know as, as uh, Apocalypse Now. But this is an actual straight adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, directed by someone who is actually more insane than Francis Coppola, Nicholas Rogue. And uh, better yet, the cast, Tim Roth and John Malkovich. Come on, give it up. You've got to love this. Uh, so anyway, uh, John Malkovich plays Kurtz. Tim Roth, Tim Roth plays the um, you know the, the the Martin Sheen part that it would be, and uh, Nicholas Rogue just makes it weird and twisted and psychotic. And no, it's not Apocalypse Now, but you know what? It's really it's a really good adaptation. It's a really good version of it, and it makes for a very very interesting uh, comparison. So all three of those are out on DVD Rs. 
And then a couple of uh, interesting Blu-ray titles from Cohen Media. One is uh, Terra Firma from uh, director Emmanuel Crialis. Oh. Te- yeah, Terra Firma is, um, it takes place in, uh, in, uh, over in Sicily, and it's about a couple of families who um, have a, let's, let's say, not a great vacation. Um, and it, things go in a very interesting direction for these two families during their, their Sicilian um, period. We'll call it their Sicilian period. Anyway, a very, very interesting film, uh, kind of classically European in many respects, was released in 2011, did not get any kind of significant release in the U.S., definitely worth reevaluating. Um, and then also from 2011 is The Prey, which is uh, also a really interesting thriller. I think this did get a limited release uh, theatrically. Anyway, but it's, uh, it's about a, uh, a crook who um, breaks out of prison um, and... Uh, has to stop, how do we put this? While in prison, he makes a mistake and he reveals too much information to somebody that he's in prison with. And then he's got to break out of prison basically to, you know, to put an end to whatever is going to happen. It's pretty great. Wait, really, you know it's pretty great? Really sharp. Would be a great American remake. Okay. Yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah. Oh, what? Should I talk or should you talk? No, 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 no. I was going to, uh, I was going to make a real quick mention of uh, Charlie Countryman, which is, stars a guy who is no longer famous. Did you know that? He's no longer famous. <laughs> God, that guy just melted down. You know what's funny is that look, like Amanda Bynes melted down, and everyone talked about it, and Lindsay Lohan melted so down. That guy melted down, and nobody's really running with it. It's just the most bizarre thing. It's because people are sick of talking about Shia LaBeouf. It's just, they're just sick of him. He you know? used to go to this. He uh, maybe he still does this bar down the street from me in Sherman Oaks. Yeah. Uh, he once went in there and, and, and got the crap kicked out of him. Good, because he's horrible. Shia LaBeouf uh, stars in Charlie Countryman and looks all kind of shaggy and ragged and he's trying to be an actor and this and he's terrible. Um, he, and and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Lars von Trier is thrilled by his meltdown now because it's just going to, it just serves to further his, his next stupid movie because he's, fu- he's fully nude in it or some damn thing. Maybe his meltdown, his performance are like Joaquin Phoenix. And no, I don't, I don't believe it. Anyway, he, 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 no, he, he plagiarized a... Uh, uh, someone it was a short story or a book or something. What was it? What was it? I, he didn't just play. Look, he didn't just plagiarize a short story to make his uh, directing debut in this little movie. When he apologized, he plagiarized the apology <laughs> and then apologized again. And then once he once he plagiarized the first apology, everybody was on notice that when he whenever he tweeted some other apology, they had to like try to find that one too. <laughs> so he apologizes again, and it turns out he plagiarized that one. And then he winds up skywriting an apology. Yeah, he's the best. He's he's just a, he's, he's, he's the a, best. He's a serial plagiarist. He's the best. And anyway. oh, and then, then he tweeted he was retiring from public life. Yeah. Frederick Bond directs him in Charlie Countryman, which is he paid. It, it, look, here, here's what this movie is. Somebody wanted to make a movie. They found out that there's money in Romania if you shoot in Bucharest. So they just invented a movie that, uh, that required them to actually go to Bucharest. So here's a guy, his, his mom, who is played by Melissa Leo, has died, and she, like, he sees these apparitions of her, and for whatever reason he decides to, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm mourning my mom, I'm just going to up and go to Romania, like everyone does when they're in grief. Anyway, and of course, so I do. You know, yeah. So he goes to Romania, and you know, he meets up with a Romanian woman played by Evan Rachel Wood, doing her very best accent. Who's involved? She's she's a musician, but she's involved with like a you know bad dude, Mads Mikkelsen, you know, who of course is part of the the the, the chin and uh, cheekbone club here, along with Till Schweiger, who's another bad dude, and you know, he gets beat up and whatever. It, it's it just makes it, it, it's, it makes no sense at all. The whole story is really disjointed, and it's trying to be this uh, American expatriate on an existential journey movie, but it never really it never really makes sense. All right, here we go. Wait from nineteen thirty seven, the great Stella Dallas with Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck plays a uh, how do you say? Barbara Stanwyck plays like this uh, rough kind of rough factory girl who winds up marrying this uh, this rich New York this rich guy from uh, named Stephen Dallas. Uh, that's why it's called Stella Dallas. Um, the husband winds up moving to New York. Uh, Stella stays behind in uh, Texas. Or where were they? Where were they living in this? I can't remember. I just I just watched the movie. Where the hell were they living? I can't remember. Uh, somewhere, I somewhere re- remote. <laughs> I just watched. I can't remember where they were living. Um, anyway, so um, the husband winds up going off to Dallas, leaving Stella behind, and all the crazy drama that she gets into while staying behind, while her husband. Um, his, her husband runs with a rich social, social circle in Manhattan. This is a great film, directed by uh, King Vidor, also uh, co-stars John Bowles and Anne Shirley, and Alan Hale. Alan Hale, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. 
the original Alan Hale. Yeah, that's right. The Skipper's Alan. Dad. Aw, Skipper's Dad. Um, by the way, the professor just died. I know. Oh. So sad. Anyway, uh, Stanwick is just heartbreaking. It's great. It's, it, it, it's, there's a lot of like mother, self-sacrificing mother tragedy in it, but it's never melodramatic. I think this film is just terrific. Um, the special features include, oh, let's just say, a Stella Dallas Vinges featurette, which isn't really worth all that much, but sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, Stella Dallas, you should definitely rent it. Also, we have, Wade, mm. the Ruddles. Oh. Now, Wade, in uh, 19, uh, I think it was like 19, 1978. Is this um, both of them? This is both of them, huh? right? The Ruddles 1 and 2. Yes, anthology. It's the anthology. Which, by yeah. the way, I'm taking. Yes, I am. Oh, no. Really? No, no, no. I love those movies. No way. Yeah. I've never seen the second one. Ah, damn it. Anyway, 1970... I'm not talking to you. 1978, (laughs) uh, Eric Idle from Monty Python and uh, Lorne Michaels from Saturday Night Live created this uh, spoof on the Beatles called The Ruddles. And uh, it was a a parody called All You Need Is Cash. And uh, it's great. The, the, there are two of them, and the Ruddles anthology includes both. It's very cheeky, very funny. It's a little bit a product of its time. If you're watching it for the first time, you may not get all the jokes and all the visual references, but still, it's very funny stuff. Um, Belushi and Aykroyd and uh, Gilda Radner, Bill Murray are all in it, um, and it's great. There's even a cameo by George Harrison. So the Ruddles anthology, it's, it's a cult classic. We've been begging for it on Blu-ray, and here it is, and it's just really good stuff. We are winding down. I'm going to uh, give you one more classic movie and then roll through uh, some of these BBC things real quickly, and then we will wrap it up. Mark, Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, uh, the John Barrymore classic from uh, 1920, beautifully color-tinted, one of the all-time great silent movies, is uh, out from a Kino Classics release, a deluxe edition on DVD and on Blu-ray. You, it just doesn't get any better than this. Um, it get, you get a fantastic musical score, a brand-new recording of a music musical score uh, performed by the uh, Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra, who does tons of great silent films, and uh, really, really good stuff. You also get the 1912 Tannhauser version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with James Cruz. You get a 15-minute cut of a rival 1920-minute uh, version starring Sheldon Lewis, and then you get a slapstick parody from 1925 starring Stan Laurel called Dr. Pickle and Mr. Pride. Um, it's just, it's, this is a great set, beautifully, beautifully transferred on Blu-ray. Uh, the DVD is, is nice as well, but the Blu-ray really captures the, the, the transfer in just pristine ways that, that will blow your mind. Uh, a lot of good BBC stuff that came out after, uh, during the past couple of months, uh, which we will just quickly make mention of. Uh, absolutely all of it, the uh, complete, absolutely fabulous set, which comes in kind of a, uh, a clutch-style package, looks like a purse. This includes everything, and they keep adding to this, so they're probably going to have to do another one as soon as they do more specials, but this includes, you know, like the Olympic specials from, and the, the 2012 AbFab Comic Relief Special and everything AbFab. So if you, if you feel like you missed some of the stuff that was released on television since the last AbFab Complete Collection, this includes all of it, but don't, there's no guarantee they won't get more. And then you also have uh, the complete Keeping Up Appearances with even newer, cooler extras. This is the Collector's Edition. If you love this show about all the sisters named after flowers, uh, it's just one, you know, primarily Patricia Rutledge, who is the the star of the uh, Roy Clark created show. Uh, This is just a wonderful comedy, one of the great British comedies of the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, you can't get better than this. Um, Really, really funny stuff. And then uh, Doctor Who, The Day of the Doctor, the 50th anniversary special, which we have mentioned before. They also sent us a 3D Blu-ray, Blu-ray and DVD combo set. I didn't even realize that they were pushing this thing on 3D Blu-ray. Doesn't really make a difference. That said, I've never seen such high-tech Daleks in my life. Uh, It's very nicely put together, and uh, the Doctor Who world that used to be so low budget is really now getting pretty pretty high end and uh and doing a great job of it so after after 50 years they are still running on all cylinders pride and prejudice the television version with colin firth and jennifer ely uh now in a keepsake edition on a two disc blu-ray people are going to go nuts for this because it always looked so crappy before in the dvd i don't know what they did but they really tuned this thing up so that the the colors are brighter the resolution is sharper this is like you've never seen it before. High definition, Pride and Prejudice uh, in a keepsake edition, just pristine. All the people who went nuts for Colin Firth uh, when he first played Darcy in this, they'll go even more nutsy for it now. Uh, and then Copper, season two. 
This is uh, you know, a BBC production, but it takes place in New York in uh, the years right after the Civil War. And uh, it's become kind of a big hit. And um, uh, probably, you know, so I, I still don't quite get it. It's sort of Gangs of New York-y is, is what, it, what it's all about. Um, this one takes place just before Lincoln's assassination. And uh, it's, you know, it's very stylish, but it's very, again, very uh, sort of Gangs of New York-ish. It's really kind of go, trying to go for this super highly stylized period between the Civil War and the Industrial Revolution where everything was changing and, you know, the America that we know today is sort of being birthed. And then lastly, two of the best things that have ever uh, come out of British television. One is Top of the Lake, which recently got a bunch of nominations for the Golden Globes. Um, this is a BBC production, however, it takes place in New Zealand because it is a, uh, it's a Jane Campion production. She created it, she wrote it, and she directed it along with Garth Davis, and it's really, really good. Uh, all that stuff that we wish Jane Campion would do more of in her feature films, and that we kind of miss going all the way back to the piano and to uh, uh, all the rest of her work, it, it's, it's here. It's, it's right here, so it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Top of the Lake is a great, great series. Um, originally aired here on BBC America. And then lastly, Downton Abbey, season four. Um, which I have not watched all of yet, working my way through it. Always amazes me that this show continues to be as vibrant and as amazing and brilliant as it is. If you haven't seen season three, I'm not going to give any of the spoilers away. A lot of people are still catching up, but there are certain tragedies in season three that trickle into season four. And uh, we now take up in 1922, and the whole Roaring Twenties thing is becoming part of this changing world. The jazz scene, liberated women, all of that stuff, and Downton Abbey demands to be seen on Blu-ray in high definition. And with that, Mark, we are done. We are? Yes, we are. Yay, I want to eat more food. All right, we'll see you guys next week.